Hi everyone, it's uh, Lizzie here, the model lead for um, Holistic Wellbeing. So this lecture is on um, intervention and prevention approaches and um, we're going to discuss uh, the following. So, you know, throughout the lecture we're going to be covering um, the types and principles of, of intervention approaches, the types and principles of prevention approaches, we're also going to look at examples of both of those and we'll um, discuss important considerations. In terms of the themes that we'll cover, um, we'll be covering early intervention for the most part. So we'll be concentrating on early intervention quite um, a lot in, in a lot of detail. Um, and then we'll touch upon health, learning, work, environment and social inclusion. Um, etc as well but we won't go into as much detail so I'll be providing you uh, lectures are here to provide you with impetus and prompts to go find out more information um, depending on your need and your interest so I hope it's going to be really useful to you okay I focus on intervention early intervention mostly because I think it, it encompasses quite a lot of the themes there already and it's just a very good strong example with a good evidence base okay so um early intervention services uh can be delivered um to parents children and um whole families um, but their main focus is to improve outcomes for children. So, for example, services may help parents who are living in challenging circumstances and provide a safe and loving environment for their child. Or if a child is displaying risk-taking behaviour, early intervention um, approaches might work with the children and their parents to find out the reasons for the child's behaviour and put strategies in place to help keep them safe. Okay, so effective early intervention um, works to prevent problems occurring or to tackle them head on when they do before problems um, get worse. Or they can um, work to reduce the risk factors and increase the protective factors in a child's life. They can also foster a whole set of personal strengths and skills that prepare a child for adult life. Um, there are three main um, forms of early intervention, but the, again, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, but for example, some forms are um, involve home visiting programs to support vulnerable parents. Others are school-based programs. Um, and they can improve children's social and emotional skills. And then others are mentoring schemes for young people who are vulnerable to um, involvement in crime, for example. Some key arguments to remember here is that some do argue that early intervention may have its strongest impact when offered during the first few years of life. Okay, and there is evidence to support that. However, there is also very strong evidence to show that effective interventions, interventions can improve children's life chances at any point during their childhood or adolescence. So there's not this kind of um, position of it's too late. Um, there's always something that can be done. Okay, so here's some of the risk factors that can threaten um, a child's development or limit their future social economic opportunities. Um, or increase the likelihood of mental health and physical health problems, criminal involvement, substance misuse, etc. There's a number of risk factors that lead to um, those potential outcomes. However, they are not deterministic or predictive at an individual level, and that's very important to remember. Um, because studies show that early intervention works best when it's made available to children on the basis of pre-identified risks. Okay, but it, what it means, that deterministic predictive aspects, just because risk factors are there in a child's life, it does not necessarily mean or predict 
that that child will have any issues. Okay, but they are helpful indicators that um, you know local governments and um, practitioners use to help identify risk and try and reduce risk. So they cannot tell us, risk factors cannot tell us exactly which child or young person will need help. Um, but they can help us um, identify children who are vulnerable and who may need extra support. And that's the main issue here. So um, here are some protective and positive factors. So they are characteristics or conditions of individuals, families, communities or society that can mitigate these risks and increase the health and well-being of children and families. So these might include, for example, um, how families develop strong relationships and emotional skills within their um, kind of family um, dynamic. Um, do they have strong support networks and friendship networks? Um, do, are the parents in good health? Um, is the family got good financial stability um, and also um, have access to good advice? And lastly, are the community services good and of high quality and easy accessible? So all these protective positive factors help um, reduce the risk um, for children um, and their needs, and of course the needs of the adults as well. Um, in many cases, risk and protective factors are two sides of the same coin. So, for example, uh, you know, a poor parental mental a poor um, parental mental health may pose a risk to the children's health and development, and that's the same as if you know the parent has good mental health, and um, that also provides us a protective um, factor against other negative outcomes. Um, particularly uh, in relation to behavioural problems or academic attainment, which are all important factors to uh, to well-being. So this is a really good um, um, model, this diagram. You might not be able to see the detail, but I've provided you with the link so you can go to the link and zoom in. You can zoom in really well. But this is, again, this kind of Bronfen, this is carried on from the Bronfen Brenner. Um, model so it's an adaptation of that and it goes in really nice detail about all those different layers that influence um, a child or an individual's uh, mental uh, sorry well-being okay and it also highlights the risk factors of the different levels um, and they cross the individual the family the community and the societal levels so the societal levels is purple communities the green um, and it, probably a little bit of the gray as well and then you've got the individual and the family uh, uh, being the, the the dark gray and the light gray okay so really really interesting and I'd advise you to go into more detail about uh, that model and here's a really good table showing the the risk factors and the positive factors um, relating to the child so they're listed there. I'm not going to read them out for you. Um, but they, it just really shows the kind of flip of the coin, if you like. Um, so that's the child. And then this... Um, sorry about that. There's um, also um, a table. And um, yeah, this... Uh, table just shows the the risk factors are on the left, the positive factors are on the right, so the protective factors, and this relates to the family. So again, really useful list it goes into more detail um, uh, than the diagram, and um, just raises your awareness. Really good to to have, and then this is the one for community. So again, risk factors on your left, positive factors on the right, and you'll see the source of um, this information uh, just below the table. So these tables I've just showed you are really, really useful because it just gives you that expanse um, examples of risk factors and positive factors, just showing you the complexity of, um, 
of early intervention and what early intervention approaches have to take into consideration and it also shows the complexity of our our development as 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 people as humans and and of course you know how kind of vulnerable our young people are and our children are to some extent but 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 how vulnerable we all are really so um really useful there and then We've got this table that shows how shows a bit more clearly like distal um, family factors um, in relation uh, to more um, more key features of the family and then the parental family and then outcomes. So this is just a model that really nicely shows how things relate to the final outcome and again it, it kind of builds upon what we've just discussed those factors listed in the tables but also the diagram and it's just another way to kind of display the, the steps and the, the kind of flow through the family uh, on to the impact of the child okay so each way is showing you and demonstrating different ways of conceptualizing and understanding um, uh, the issues okay so it's important to recognise risk factors don't automatically translate into the situation that a child actually experiences. This is because their influence on the child, so the risk factor influences on the child, is mediated by many other factors, uh, and particularly by their family. And that's highlighted in this chart above, um, but also shows how wider social forces flow through the family to impact on the child which again is nicely showed in that um, that big Bromfenbrenner style diagram. Parents and other caregivers work to nurture and protect children within wider social forces, but these wider factors also permeate their lives as well. So I'm going to just pause, uh, stop the video there because there's only a 15 minute um, um, limit to these recordings and I'm at 12 minutes now and um, the next bit of the lecture is, is just a good place to pause here and then we'll go on to the next bit of the lecture. It will carry on talking about early intervention um, in this part two. This one is part one. Okay so I'll pause here and I'll um, record the next part of the lecture. Part two.